I began my presentation with two questions which have concerned me personally over the years. The first question was why Buddhism first began to flourish in the West in the middle and late 1960s. And then the second question was why Buddhism has taken a largely secular turn in the West. Um, so I began, I approached the first question by tracing some of the trends in Western thought that emerged in the 1950s and continued in the 1960s. For example, the breakdown of a unified narrative about the place of human beings in the universe, the emergence of existentialist modes of thought, the decline in interest in the theistic religions, Judaism and Christianity, um, the rise of psychology as a, providing a scientific understanding of the mind, the turn towards psychotherapy as being a way to cure the illnesses of modern life. And then out of this came a deeper understanding, a, a deeper interest in understanding the nature of the mind, which led a number of Buddhist pioneers to began experimenting with Buddhist teachings and Buddhist meditation practices. And so all of this was taking place starting in the middle and late 1960s. As Western Buddhism began to develop, certain fault lines began to appear, differences between the ways in which Westerners were engaging with Buddhism. And I distinguish three primary modes in which Westerners were adopting and practicing Buddhism. So the first is what I call traditional Buddhism, and this is a form of Buddhist practice which is based upon and grounded in the traditional worldview of Buddhism, the ideas of karma, rebirth, the idea that we migrate through a process of, of repeated existences called samsara, and that the aim of Buddhist practice is to reach a stage of transcendent liberation, which is known as nirvana. In contrast to this, there emerged, maybe beginning in the late 1990s, as a result of the progressive westernization of Buddhism, a kind of Buddhism that called itself secular Buddhism, which deliberately and consciously and even provocatively rejected the main tenets of traditional Buddhism, which pushed to the side, deleted the teachings of karma, rebirth, samsara, the idea of nirvana as an ultimate goal, and took the aim of Buddha's practice to be able to live meaningfully and beneficially here in the present. Then I distinguished a third mode of Buddha's practice, which might even be the predominant mode of Buddha's practice, which I don't think has been recognized as such. And I call this imminent Buddhism. What I mean by this is a form of Buddha's practice, Buddha's understanding, which is concerned entirely with the concrete experiential benefits that come from Buddhist practice, but does not, in that way, is similar to secular Buddhism. But unlike secular Buddhism, it does not consciously and deliberately and on rational grounds reject the traditional doctrines of Buddhism, but just keeps them aside as something irrelevant which holds that the whole meaning and value of, Buddhist, of Buddhism consists in the concrete experiential benefits that the practice of the Dharma brings in the present. Okay, having distinguished these three modes of Buddhist practice, then I presented a critique of these, of the secular and the imminent modes of Buddhist practice on the grounds that they discard too much that is central to the persistent identity of Buddhism through the centuries, through the generations. And I argue that these principles are essential not because they're metaphysical beliefs, not because they're presumptuous truth claims, because these are teachings that come from the Buddha himself that the Buddha himself used to establish 
the framework for his teaching. And if we discard these very fundamental and basic teachings, it's possible that Buddhism itself in the future is going to lose its distinct identity and just turn into a secular means of self-improvement, of maybe a light meditative cultivation without the embrace of those fundamental principles which give the Dharma its fuller background of meaning and its goal of aspiration. In the course of this conference, we've heard many presentations on different aspects of Buddhism and its engagement with the contemporary world. And I think as Buddhism is, passes from its traditional background into the modern world, it's essential that Buddhists find ways of addressing the challenges that are thrown up by contemporary life, contemporary society, um, you know, some of these momentous challenges that it's never faced throughout its long history. And the purpose of this conference has been to bring together scholars and thinkers and practitioners who are able to discuss these problems openly, clearly, and present a multitude of perspectives of how Buddhism is going to thrive and to persist in the modern world.